Hey everybody, welcome back to our study in Jude. We are getting close to the end and today we are going to look at Jude verse 11 and we're not going to get anywhere outside of that verse. Uh, And that's what we looked at last week. So yeah, we spent two sessions on one verse, but it's going to be good. Uh, So let's just go ahead and read it. Uh, Jude 1 verse 11. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Now, last time we talked about Cain and we talked about Korah's rebellion, and today we're going to sit in Balaam's error. Now, this story takes place in Numbers and actually goes through Numbers 22 through 24. So we're going to read all those chapters. Um, I'm just kidding. We will kind of skip around, but we will read a lot of it um, just because I want everyone to see. I'll summarize what can be summarized, but I I like being able to see like this is what it says there because sometimes we need to look at exactly what it says um, when we're explaining what happened. So let's just jump right in. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippar, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, The horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So we can see they're pretty scared of these Israelites. They see a large group coming. And so Balak sends messengers with a divination fee to get Balaam, a soothsayer, to put a curse on these people. And Balaam tells them when they arrive, Spend the night here, and I'm going to get an answer from the Lord. And so now let's jump back in, Numbers 22. Verse 9, God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippar, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. So Balaam sends him away, just like God told him to do. Um, But Balak sends again for Balaam, and this time he sends more officials with higher rankings and more money. I think that he thinks, well, Balaam must say, man, this is not enough money for me to do this. And so he tries to send a little bit more and please Balaam and tell him you'll be rewarded more handsomely uh, this time. And so let's look again at what happens in Numbers 22, 18. But Balaam answered them, Even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now spend the night here so that I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite officials. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. So Balaam goes, saddles his donkey, right? Best ride in town, and and heads off uh, with these officials to go to Balak. And so now we're really going to get into this scripture, and we're going to read a lot of it, because we need to see what happens. And this story might start getting a little bit familiar, because part of the story um, is told in Sunday school sometimes. So the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat it to get back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. 
The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared it. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's officials. Now, what is really surprising here is that Balaam, is, when the donkey talks to him, he's just like, this is why I'm mad at you. He doesn't, he's not like, what are you saying? He's just like, well, donkey, this is why I'm mad to you. You've made me look like a fool. Not the fact that I'm sitting here ha having a conversation with my donkey. Um, very interesting. So let's just cut back. We're going to go right back to 2241. The next morning... Balak took Balaam up to Bamoth Baal, and from there he could see the outskirts of the Israelite camp. Balaam said, Build me seven altars here, and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me. Balak did as Balaam said, and the two of them offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stay here beside your offering while I go aside. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet with me. Whatever he reve reveals to me, I will tell you. Then he went off to a barren height. God met with him, and Balaam said, I have prepared seven altars, and on each altar I have offered a bull and a ram. The Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Go back to Balak and give him this word. So he went back to him and found him standing beside his offering with all the Moabite officials. Then Balaam spoke his message. Balak brought me from Aram, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come, denounce Israel. How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? From the rocky peaks I see them. From the heights I view them. I see a people who live apart and do not consider themselves one of the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number even a fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and may my final end be like theirs. Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies, but you have done nothing but bless them. He answered, Must I not speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? Then Balak said to him, Come with me to another place where you can see them. You will not see them all, but only the outskirts of the camp. And from there, curse them for me. So a lot's happening here. Balak continues to take Balaam to different high places for Balaam to see if he can get something else from there. See if he can get some other kind of divination and maybe he can curse them from a different mountaintop. Balaam in this passage gives seven total prophetic messages and I encourage you to go read them. They're all blessings, no curses. And at the end of this, Balak grows angry and he sends Balaam away. And this story uh, it's kind of crazy. I've always thought the story is kind of crazy because it brings forth a number of questions. The first question that comes to mind. So Balaam, he's a pagan. He's a soothsayer, right? How is he hearing from God? The second question I have typically is why is God mad at him for going when he told him to go? And the last question is like, okay, um, when we're looking at Jude, it's a negative example, right? Balaam's error. But here, he looks like a good guy. He looks like a man of God, right? He's blessing the people of Israel. And this is why we're going to camp here for a little bit. There's just too many questions that we have to explain, and we don't want to gloss over it. So let's address the first question. How is he hearing from God? Well, this isn't the only time this happens in the Bible where someone who is pagan hears from God. And we're going to look at another text where this happens to hopefully explain how this is happening. So if you would, turn with me to 1 Samuel 28, verse 3. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul, when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said, an Ewok. I'm just kidding. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the women. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? 
Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like? He said. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army into the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and all that night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your servant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. A long passage. And you might be wondering, why are we getting into this? Uh, but it helps explain what's happening in the other passage. And you might think this is just bringing up more questions. Um, but as we dig in, you're going to see the point I want to make. So this woman, she's a medium. Okay, that means she's the go-between. She is the one who, who talks for Saul and talks for Samuel. But when she sees Samuel, she cries out. He says, bring up Samuel. And she's not concerned by the name, but when she actually sees Samuel, she cries out. That's a bit of a surprise from someone who's used to doing this, who's used to bringing back the dead, right? And talking with spirits. She's surprised that it's happening. And this may bring another question as to ghosts and calling them back. I believe this is a one-time thing God does to drive home his words to Saul, to drive home, I've taken the kingdom from you, just like I said I would, and I've given it to David. And it's almost like I've caught you red-handed. Here you are with this medium that you know I despise, and I've told you not to use, and here you use them, and this is why. So then this conversation is actually just between Samuel and Saul. After this medium brings up Samuel, she falls to the wayside. She's just a bystander. She takes a back seat while Samuel and Saul are talking. As a medium, that shouldn't be happening. She is the go-between. So we can see that she's really got nothing to do with this. Samuel and Saul are talking. She's supposed to be the, the translator, but she's a bystander. And at the end... Only by moving closer to Saul does she realize that he's terrified. This implies she didn't hear the conversation. If he, she had heard the conversation that Saul and his sons were going to die tomorrow, she would probably understand, oh, he's not going to be in the best mood. And so I think that this something similar is happening with Balaam, where God is using this pagan for his own purpose. And I think, I think we'll see his purpose soon. But I don't believe that Balaam has a relationship with God prior to this incident. We can see a lack of familiarity with God in, verse, in chapter 24, verse 1 of Numbers. If you remember, they continually set up seven altars for sacrifice. If you, in Israel, they set up one altar. One altar for one God. The seven altar practice is to many gods. Seven is the number for completeness. And so it's like not to leave anyone out. Seven altars is for many gods, all the gods, right? So it's most likely a sacrifice to all the gods. And they do this twice on two different high places. Now, these high places where Balak takes Balaam were pagan places. They, they were high up on the mountains, closer to the gods. So you had a better view of the stars and the elements. So you were more likely to hear from them. But after they do this seven altar thing twice, Balaam doesn't do it again or resort to divination. He, he doesn't do it, go through the normal practices because he finally realizes that he doesn't need to. He doesn't do all this, need to do all this stuff. God is talking to him. So we see he's discovering more about God as he goes along. And in the third prophetic message, he says in Numbers 24, 3, that he says that his eyes have been opened. 
This God is unlike anything in the past. This is for real. And this just shows us God can and will use whomever he wants to send a message. They don't necessarily need to be godly men or women. And in this instance, God does this for the benefit of his people. See, warning Balak not to attack the Israelites through Balaam, a man he trusts, it keeps God's people safe. It keeps them from war. It's actually giving a warning to Balak. And that's the reason I think God is doing this. Now, hopefully that answers that question, which leads to our second question. Why is God mad at him for going when he told him to go? But before we answer that question, we have to ask this question. Why did God tell him to go and then change his mind? Does God change his mind? Now, I think that even though God knows how this plays out, he wants to give Balaam opportunities to be obedient. God always gives us opportunities to be obedient. We have free will and we can choose to obey. And Balaam has free will and can choose to obey. But as this offered reward gets higher, God knows the temptation is greater. And he knows Balaam's heart. He knows what Balaam's going to do in the end. And so I believe he lets him go. He was always going to let him go. But I think he wants to drive home to Balaam that he will be obeyed. I also think there's always something in the timing of God. And I think the timing of God was not right just yet. In Numbers 22, 20, God tells him to do only. He says, do only what I tell you to do. Remember that. There's a few instances where God is testing Balaam and wants to show him that he will be obeyed. And he gives him something to do and we'll watch it change a little bit. So why was God mad at him for going? when he told him to go. In Numbers 23, 22, it says God was very angry when he went, right? This is kind of like a, a spouse fight, right? He's like, no, you can go. Oh, you're gonna go. Hmm, well, you should have known that I didn't want you to go. I, I do think Balaam wanted to go anyway because God had already told him, this is kind of funny, God had already told him not to go. And then when they come back with more money, he says, let me go talk to God again and see what he thinks. Well, God had already given him his answer. And sometimes we do the same thing, right? Sometimes we're like, man, God told me no on this, but let me keep praying and praying until, because maybe he wants to say yes. And God's like, I've already given you the answer, right? But in this text, we can, we can see something that's very interesting. So it says, God told Balaam to go, and then he became angry with him as he went. But isn't Balaam being obedient? But the phrase, when he went, or as he went, can also be interpreted as he was going. As he was going. Now Balaam, let's remember, he's a man who gives curses for money. It is his job to curse people for money. And he has been offered increasing rewards from a king and great honor. It's easy for me to assume what his thoughts might have been along the way, right? You see him just focused on the reward, right? Or perhaps the power of this new God, what money could be made from it. Like, okay, maybe I'll have to obey and do this thing for Balak, which isn't going to give me a big reward, but there's some chances down the road I could use this for money. Or maybe there's some way I can twist this for my benefit so I can do what God told me to do, but I can also get what I want out of it, right? So God put the angel in his way to put the fear of God in him. And Balaam can't recognize that God is in his way. How often do we head into danger, or maybe we're like following God, but there's a seed in our hearts that could just get us off track a little bit, and God continually gets in the way to stop us for our own good, to help us to see correctly, to help us have a change of heart, and we don't recognize it. We don't recognize it because our eyes are on the prize and not the path. We can see here that Balaam was working out a plan in his head. There is a seed there that can lead him astray. And we know that this is happening because in Numbers 22, 32, the angel says in the King James Version, Thy way is perverse before me. You're twisting. The, the way that you are going is twisting what I told you to do. It's twisting the path. And Balaam was going to twist it for his gain. And so God is more specific this time. If you remember last time, he said, do only what I tell you to do. But now that he sees Balaam's thoughts, he says, say 
only what I tell you to say. Say only what I tell you to say. Now, these continued warnings and the fact that God felt he needed to put a healthy fear in him alludes to the true nature of Balaam. So we know Balaam gets there and he says only what God tells him to say. And it seems like the story is over. So why is he brought up as a negative example in Jude? Well, let's look at Numbers 25 real quick. While Israel was staying in Shittim, remember that place, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. Now this god Baal, we hear this name so often in the Bible, was thought to control fertility. And how you worship this god was through sex with priestesses at, at his temple, right? Like prostitutes. So orgies, all this stuff is, is sexual. All the worship of Baal is sexual. Now, Balaam and Balak have similar prefixes for a reason. Uh, back in the day, everyone was named after their god. Uh, Daniel was named after his god. And actually, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are names that the Babylonians gave them to honor their gods there. Everyone was named after a god. So Balaam and Balak are most likely named after, you guessed it, Baal. And this high place that Balak takes Balaam to, Bamath Baal, is the, this is the first high place they go to. That's actually a high place of Baal, a worship site to that god. So we know that Balaam and Balak, one of the gods they serve, is Baal. And before we go any further, uh, I have been asked in the past, are there other gods? Right? We see this often in the Bible. There's even a command that says, there shall be no other gods before me. And some people look at this and say, are there other gods? But we can look at 1 Corinthians 10, 20 that says this to answer that question. In the New International Version, it says, No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. So that tells us these other gods aren't gods at all. They're demons. So let's continue on. And we're going to jump to Numbers 31. we got to piece this together like detectives. So let's look at Numbers 31, 8. And 16. They also killed Balaam, son of Bear, with the sword. This is the Israelites. We see they killed Balaam later. And in 16, it says, Because they were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord in the PR incident, so that a plague struck the Lord's people. So this tells us that incident we just read about of sexual immorality where the people in Shittim, where the people turned against God, this happened because of the advice Balaam gave to entice the men into sexual immorality. So how did this happen? How does Balaam go from a, a guy talking to God and giving prophetic messages to enticing the people into sexual immorality and sin and actually following another God? Well, guys, Balaam... He's a soothsayer. We, that's what, man, that's a tongue twister. He is a soothsayer, right? And this is what he does for money. This is his job. He, he makes money from this, this work. And he's used to being highly respected. But now, I mean, let's think about this. He tells Balak, this king, he, he's called to give curses and he doesn't. He gives blessings, right? Word is going to get around to all the pagan kings about Balak, about Balaam, confusing, right? And so they're they're probably not going to want his services at all, right? So now he's kind of isolated. How is he going to make money? But at the end, and, and where's he going to go? What's he going to do? Well, if we look at the end of one of his prophetic messages, the first prophetic message in uh, Numbers 23.10, he says, let me die the death of the righteous and may my final end be like theirs. Now, some people think this isn't actually part of the prophecy, but something that Balaam says in response to what he's saying, right? So we know that Balaam sees only good things ahead for these people, right? They've got a powerful God. He even wishes for his end to be like theirs. So it would be natural for him to seek them out, 
right? He could perhaps, hmm, I could perhaps have a position of power there. I talked to their God. I've kind of burned my bridges over here, and I know that this, this these people are blessed. Maybe I can just see Balaam working it out. I'm going to go be, be a soothsayer for these people. What he doesn't know is they already have priests, and they already hear from God. So Balaam becomes kind of worthless. So it's doubtful Balaam would have humbled himself to learn from the Israelites, right? Humbled himself to learn about God. I mean, he's used to a position of power and he's used to being the only one and he's used to making money from this. Balaam had one amazing experience with God that could have been life-changing, but I don't think he ever took the time to learn more about God or to surrender to God or to serve God. He continues his life as he wills. And this happens for all of us. I don't know how many people I've talked to that say, I experienced God a lot of times they say at, at a youth camp. I feel like I experienced God one time in my life at a youth camp or I experienced God in worship one time. I've even talked to people who said, I've been healed by God this one time. But then you look at their life and they've like strayed or drifted and not aren't interested in following God because they never took the time. They had this amazing experience with God but they never surrendered to him. They never committed to serving him. They never committed to learning more about him, getting in his word and finding out who this God is. And that's Balaam's error, right? And so he tries to bring together God's people and his own pagan cultural practices. Maybe he knows better. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's just trying to blend the two worlds because, hey, I like this. I like that. We do the same thing, right? How we blend culture with church and we put it together. We can have the best of both worlds. I think Balaam just wants the best of both worlds. Well, if we look at Revelation 2.14, it says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Maybe Balaam, on second thought, after a while, thought, well, these Israelites aren't going to give me any money, and I'm not getting any money from them. Maybe I can go back to Balak, and even though I can't curse the people, I can tell him some ways he can maybe weaken them, right? And this is how God, we know God saw his heart, and like, don't, per- don't pervert my ways. Don't twist what I tell you to do. And we see, in the end, Balaam does twist what God wanted him to do, and he does his own thing. In 2 Peter 2.15, it says, They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of wickedness. He loved the wages of wickedness. That's what we've been talking about. That's how he made his money, wickedness. And he committed the ultimate sin. Balaam's error is teaching others to sin. Teaching others to sin. And that is what Jude is warning the people of. These people... These people are leading you astray. They are teaching you to sin. They are wandering into Balaam's error. Do not follow them. But there's one more thing in this warning. Because, man, if you don't believe God wrote the scriptures, this is the evidence here, is that each warning just has so many different elements to it. If we look at Numbers 25, it tells us that this event where the people were led astray by Balaam happened in, where do you remember? Shittim. Well, let's look in Joshua 2.1 real quick. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. This ties it all together. Jericho was the first place that the Israelites invade when they go into the promised land. So Shittim is the last place the Israelites camped before they entered the promised land. This further drives home Jude's point that we can be led astray before the end. So many Israelites were led astray right right at the doors of the promised land, right before they went in, right before Jericho, right before that first battle. They're led astray right before the end. There's so much depth to this rebuke. We've all experienced God. We've all experienced God in some way or we wouldn't be here watching this. But we have to learn His ways. We have to seek his face. We have to serve him. We we can't mix our own desires with God's. And I think this letter Jude writes, he's he's not rebuking them as like, "You you deserve to be lost. You deserve this to happen. This isn't his attitude. His attitude is like, please just listen. 
please just listen. Remember this. And he's bringing out, the Holy Spirit brings things to remembrance. And he's saying, remember this. Remember that. Remember what happened here. If you remember, if you remember, when we first started studying Jude, we learned that the Holy Spirit changed what Jude was going to write about. The Holy Spirit wanted to warn his people in a way that called them back. Remember this. Remember this. Don't fall into this. And so he does the same with us today. He's calling us to remembrance. Remember what I said. Remember who I am. Seek me. It's not like you're going to be lost before the end. It's like don't get lost before the end. And so I plead with you. The Holy Spirit pleads with you. Chase after God. Humble yourself. Commit to surrendering to God, to serving God, to learning about God. He is calling us to him. He's calling us closer so so that we are not lost before the end. So we don't teach other people to sin and fall into Balaam's error. God desires you. He desires all of you. And he desires us as Christians to teach people to do right to teach people to follow God because it is God's heart for all of us to be with him in the promised land. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you that you love us. I just thank you that you are good. I thank you that your Holy Spirit moved Jude's hand to give us this warning. I thank you that we can look in your word and see how it ties all together and see the depth of who you are, Lord. You don't miss a thing. Your word is complete. And I pray that your word would be made complete in us, Lord. I just pray that your Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance what you've said and who you are and what you've done, Lord, that we may focus on you, that our hearts may be drawn to you and that we could be more like you. And I thank you that you make that possible through your Son and through your Holy Spirit. We thank you and we praise you for all that you've done, for all that, you do, all that you're doing, and we thank you for speaking to us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I hope you guys have a blessed week. I love you.